Hello, I'm Michael Parker. Welcome to Antidote. Today we have a beautiful show with a beautiful guest. We're going to be talking about sexual healing. It's way more than just a Marvin Gaye song. How does one go from a childhood of sexual trauma to an adulthood of peace and acceptance and healing others? Today's guest has done that. She is a relationship. She is a sexual trauma expert. She teaches tantric yoga. She teaches her own system of yoga called O Yoga. She is the very charming and wildly exotic Psalm Isadora. Psalm, welcome to Antidote. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's good to be here. Um, you're fantastic. I found out about you recently, mm -hmm. although it seems like you're pretty well known in LA. I get around. <laughs> I, I found you um, in LA Yoga Magazine, mm -hmm. uh, an interview that you had written. I thought it was quite good. And yeah. then I started looking you up online. I found out more about you. So I wanted to have you in. And um, you had a tough childhood. Yeah. And that is the impetus for why you do the work that you do. So for our viewers who don't maybe know who you are and what you do, tell us a little bit about what happened to you as a child. Well, a lot of people ask me, you know, how did I become a sex expert? And I became a sex expert because I actually came from a very disempowered place with my sexuality and had such a lack of sexual education and so much shame around it um, that it's become my mission to kind of like share that with the world and to change that. Um, I grew up on a very religious Christian cult. Um, so much so, like, I grew up in a log cabin, wearing a bonnet, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, a skirt to my knees and an apron, and we tried to live like Little House on the Prairie. And, you know, in that kind of environment, um, with the Christianity, there was a lot of ideas of, you know, as a woman, you know, um, cover your body or you'll make men sin. And, you know, the women live separate from the men. Um, and, and I grew up, like, you know, wanting to win. So I, like, really tried to be good. You know, if it mm -hmm. was going to be Little House on the Prairie, I was going to be Laura. <laughs> you know, like, I was going to go 100%. And um, what happened was I had sexual abuse. So, you know, and with an in environment like that where there's so much lack of education and shame around sexuality and all these messages to girls and women that it's really our fault um, when something happens to us sexually. Uh, I suppress that. I didn't speak out about that. I suppressed the memories for a very long time. And because of that, um, I ended up being very angry and rebellious as a teenager. And, you know, I felt like no matter what I'd done to be the good girl, you know, all those painful things had still happened to me. And so I finally ran away from my religious boarding school at 17 and left my family because there was abuse there. And I ended up getting pregnant on purpose because I wanted to start my own family or just to have that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, that kind of put me out into the world with a, a very unique set of challenges. So I already came from sexual trauma and abuse and had all this guilt and internalized shame about my sexuality. Um, and then I'm a single mom, you know, a teenager, and now I have to take care of my kid even though I haven't healed myself. And so my 20s were just like an absolute hot mess <laughs> where I actually moved here and I was living in Hollywood and I was like trying to do a good job taking care of my son, but I had so many just demons inside myself from all that unhealed trauma you know, that I remember I'd, I'd like, you know, I'm going to be a good mom, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll do the right thing. And then I just, all this pain inside me, and I'd end up, you know, like sneaking out at night to go get drunk, you know, to numb my pain and climbing in, you know, my bedroom window in the morning so my son wouldn't know. So it was this role, role reversal because I never grew up yeah. in certain ways and still hadn't, um, you know, learned how to parent myself when I'd had that kind of break in my childhood from the trauma. Um, and not being parented properly. So, so that, that ultimately led me to a rock bottom um, where you know, I was in an emergency room on medication for depression and anxiety um, and then self-medicating because when the medication for my depression made me so lethargic that I didn't get out of bed and gain 30 pounds, I hit a day that I was like, I didn't have money to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the energy to get out of bed. I didn't have the energy to read my son like stories at night or play with him. And if anything makes you feel guilty, I think as a parent is like your child saying, you know, will you come spend time with me? Will, you know, will you read to me? Will you play with me? And he's like, oh, I'm busy right now. I'm, I'm too tired right now. I'll do it later. And then later, later, later adds up until you've missed 
so much of their childhood that you don't get back. But let me just say this, uh, everything you're just saying, and uh, but it wasn't your fault. I mean, you were molested from within your own family at a very young age, and you're already in, listen, the 70s and these types of religious cults, I hear this a lot. I, I have friends who are in strange religious cults, and all of them, there's, they have issues. So this, <laughs> this, is, this is not your fault. To say the least. <laughs> this is not your fault. So yeah. not to mention all the weird ideas that puts in your head about family and, mm -hmm. and the parental roles and your role. Mm -hmm. And did you have brothers or sisters? I did. I had um, two younger brothers, one older half brother, and all of us ended up like running away before we were 18 because there was just so much, you know, physical abuse mm -hmm. in our household. So, you know, really, I think you with with trauma like that, really, no matter where you turn, again, there's no way to be good enough that that doesn't happen to you. Um, and then, as a teenager, I was just still silent. And, and this is where, you know, for me, this is such a mission because where there's trauma, there's silence. And especially if the abuse comes within your family, you know, at, and you learn to just like to survive, you're not allowed to say the truth. And so all this trauma builds up. And then I was a rebellious teenager and I was very self-destructive. And then I see other teenagers now, you know, where you hear about them cutting mm -hmm. or you hear about them, you know, like and, and acting out and everybody goes, oh, why are they so rebellious? Uh, I, I think, you know, probably nine out of ten times there's some serious trauma going on that leads up to that, and they have no way to speak their pain, so they act out their pain, mm -hmm. but in ways that are self-destructive. Well, when you got the strength to get yourself together, how did this happen? I mean, because when you mentioned that in your 20s you were doing drugs and mm -hmm. trying to, I, I totally get that. <laughs> um, I've been there myself. Um, but at some point, you said, you know what, I'm gonna change this. Yeah, you know what, you said something interesting. You just said it wasn't my fault, like it's not your fault. And I do think that's a very powerful thing to say to people who have trauma and who've been victims, is it's not your fault because somehow we always feel it is our fault. We did something to ask for it. We did something to call it upon it. We're unlucky or you know, we're somehow flawed or broken forever. Um, but there comes a point that the only way out of that box and out of these cycles of reenactment, mm -hmm. right? Because what, I was doing drugs, I was putting myself in situations, you know, relationships that mm -hmm. were similar to my parents, mm -hmm. dating boyfriends that had similar dynamics to the abuse that I grew up with, or at least that kind of excitement level, mm -hmm. because you come to associate love with this very high register of danger and excitement. So like, right. if I'm not, if I'm not literally hitting like, ah, like a thousand percent on my Richter scale of my adrenal glands, you don't love me. This isn't, you know, because that's what I heard the word love and it got programmed in my brain when all that was like going on. Um, so I think there's, there's all of that, but I was in this reenactment pattern. And when I hit my rock bottom in the emergency room, the difference was I went in there and I started to think, well, I have no one to call. You know, I can't even call my parents to help me. I'm broke. I'm in the emergency room. I'm almost dead. And something finally woke up inside me and it was um, some voice in me and was like, see, that's why you're here because you keep waiting for someone else to save you and you keep you know, being the victim. It's not fair, it's not fair. You know, it's not my fault. It's like, no, it's not my fault and it's not fair, but at some point, especially if you have trauma, you have to fight for your own life because you know, life isn't fair. Right. And if you happen to have had to live through these kinds of circumstances that are so difficult, sexual abuse, physical abuse, some kind of trauma, then you more than anyone are gonna have to have something rise up inside you and be the hero of your own life. Mm -hmm. And not endlessly, you know, I'd gone to therapy before that was like, what's wrong with me and what happened? And there's nothing, you know, therapy can be great, but all the talk therapy, all I ever felt I did was like get more depressed because I was like, I'm so screwed, I'm so screwed. Mm -hmm. I'm, I was screwed up before, I'm screwed up now. Um, and so I, 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 it wasn't giving me more, sort of what I needed was hope and an actual connection to better energy or a more positive feeling in life. And that's what happened after my rock bottom. The other voice, you know, said, you, you're here because you keep feeling sorry for yourself. You're here because this broken little girl keeps waiting for my daddy to show up, my mommy to show up. Um, and they should have, and they didn't, but they're not going to. And that's one thing people have to really, like if you're a survivor of trauma, you, again, have to own your own life at some point and say, no one else is showing up. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be your new partner. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be anyone but you. You can find mentors, but you 
yet you better find a mentor and you better find a good path. And the path I found was, was yoga because it sounds so silly, you know, like, like a lot of people, well, when you're coming from a background of being on, you know, Xanax so you can breathe, because I used to have such intense panic attacks, finding yoga and learning to breathe and the mind, body, spirit connection, that was the breakthrough I was missing. Because when I was just going to therapy and talking, it was all so mental, like as I'd feel drained after. And when I started going to yoga, I'd like inhale and exhale. And just even right now, when I, I feel a surge of positive energy, which mm -hmm. is scientifically dopamine, <laughs> you know, and serotonin, mm -hmm. I'm happier. Sure. I'm now like, if I do this, you know, a few times and then I look at you, I'm almost a different person. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, your thoughts and the words you say come from the chemistry in your body. So if my body chemistry is low from trauma, I can give these new positive, you know, I can create a new positive body chemistry through yoga or through other behavior modification. Okay, well, I want to return to that because yeah. I've got some ideas I, I want to express to you. So what you are, I mean, you're an expert. You help primarily women, I think. I mostly work with, I, I have courses online for men and women because men are very interested, you know, in studying around sure sacred sexuality or, <laughs> yeah, hey. <laughs> Come on. But, but for me, I only do live programs with women yeah. because I found that to be like, I don't want to be in a room with 100 men and I'm the one sex object that felt re-traumatizing to me. a little weird, I'm little sure. too much, but, the, but for videos, I have those, I've got them covered. <laughs> She's on YouTube, find it. Um, okay, so my question then is, and we're gonna return to yoga, but mm -hmm. when we talk about trauma, one of the things I was thinking about when I was writing these questions, do men and women experience trauma in a different way, or do we just kind of manifest the same behavior patterns? You know, so I'm all about women's empowerment. Yeah because I'm a woman, yeah. I have a vagina, you know. Sure. <laughs> that's, that's how I work, that's how I'm wired. Um, but, you know, I think it's harder for men. I actually think when- Because of our programming, the way we have to deal with it? There's more shame, because my whole message is, so let's break through shame, let's break through shame, open your voice, be able to speak, and it's so hard for even, for women to do that, because I think women are suppressed to express ourselves in particular ways. Right, we're, we're, we're shamed to not just say what we want and to manipulate and act cute from when we're little girls to get what we want. Right. Men are allowed to say what they want, but they're not allowed to express any feelings or Attached weakness. Attached to it. Yeah, so let's say for, for a man who's had sexual abuse, any kind of trauma is difficult for men to get to express and their shame around a weakness or an emotion. But um, sexual trauma, especially because often the sexual trauma um, came from a man. Mm -hmm. So in our society, if a, if a man is to say, I was molested by another man, there's this, you know, he's afraid he'll be considered gay. Sure. Um, and, and so there's another layer of shame and silence. So I, I think, you know, it's even more difficult, I think, for men. And I have a lot of compassion for that. And that's why I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not like trying to sell something. I'm literally just trying to solve a problem that's so huge in our world. You know, you said sexual healing, like it's more than a Marvin Gaye song, but it's like, I needed sexual healing. A lot of people need sexual healing. Even if they don't have trauma, people need to like have, uh, you understand your sexuality is like one of the most important building blocks of everything going on in your life. And the whole freaking planet <laughs> needs well, sexual energy. healing. I, yeah. I've heard you say that this is energy. And it's I, the energy that created you. So the most natural thing that ever happened, right, is sex. And the most sacred thing that you can ever do is sex. And yet, we've made it dirty. And yet, we as a society and a planet, I don't know, you know, some people say, oh, it's better in Europe. It's somewhat better in Europe. It's still not great. There's not one place on our planet right now that has, I think, truly healthy attitudes around sexuality. Okay. Uh, well, I'm get, that's largely because of men. I, I, <laughs> so, and the only reason I'm saying that, because uh, people are going to write, oh, Parker's, you know, <laughs> you know, talking about men. No, but look, in a, in a patriarchal society, then yes, we're gonna write a lot of the rules. And one thing mm -hmm. I was gonna ask you, that also means we probably don't know everything we need to know. So tell me. Well, so let, let's take that a step by word. Why have men made the world more sexually repressive, especially for women? Like I grew up on this commune, cult, yeah. right? And the religion said, women, you know, cover your bodies or you're gonna make the men sin, right? So where did that come from? To me, I went to India, I studied Tantra, which is actually like learning how to control that sexual energy. <laughs> and I said, I thought about it and I was there and I traveled to countries where women's bodies are covered head to toe. And you know, the, there's a connection. The more women's bodies are covered, the higher the sexual violence. Or the, more, the more they more marry the off teenage girls with no choice. Yeah. Right? And, and, and the more that women are allowed to walk around or there's nudity in societies, there's less sexual violence, there's less rape. 
So I said, what kind of world would we live in if men were taught to train their dicks instead of women told to cover their bodies because men can't control themselves? There's always this like endless, you know, like, well, men are weaker or men can't. I was like, you know, bullshit. <laughs> I call bullshit. Or, or even if it's hard for you, you know what? You go to the gym to exercise every other muscle. Why don't you learn how to control that muscle? Uh, you know what? <laughs> I, I, that, that makes far too much sense for it to actually be true. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Well, that you basically, I was going to ask you, what is something that men don't know about feminine sexuality? Because when we were talking about this whole patriarchal structure and why is it like this? So what are, what else are we missing? What else are we not getting? Um, you know, I, I think that um, I have to say, by and large, the men who I actually talk to are usually the kind of men who really want to learn more. So, so I'm just like not traveling to the places where they're telling me, you know, don't teach about sex. So, you know, I have so many well-meaning men, you know, they're like, I want to please women more. Um, but like, you know, when you went to school and they did the, the you know, sex ed talk, did, no. did they do that? I'm not that old. I know. I know I'm saying I, I went to school. I, I went, they, they did not teach us birds. I mean, it was, it, was pretty, I went it was pretty dull, but yes, right. I had it. Okay. So did they show you here's a vagina, here's a clitoris, here's different ways women yeah. can orgasm, you know, since you're going to be operating this machinery, <laughs> like if you're going to go out and have sex, yeah. here's how you can, you know, uh, help a woman ha achieve an orgasm. Hey, it isn't just about you, yeah. right? I don't remember that part. I think even all our sex ed it was is geared around. utilitarian. It's not even utilitarian. Again, it's patriarchal without people knowing because yeah. the whole thing is about putting a condom on the male, you know, avoiding pregnancy, but there's really no teaching about the female anatomy and how women can enjoy pleasure and that like how men can please women versus just like deal with their own erection. Or I don't their remember own anything desire. actually about pleasure in sexual education. Right. It was well, they're more like, just the educational yeah. aspect of it. So like, it was, don't go do this. It's like getting the invisible man, you know, when you're a kid, <laughs> those things you put together. Um, yeah. So, well, okay. Monot so well, okay, so so you just said what what do men know? I can't get into all know. of it, but like, do you know that women can have seven kinds of orgasms? No. <laughs> well, now you have to go to my, get my video course. Seven. <laughs> Salmasador.com. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, seven. You might be the, missing a few. <laughs> okay. Okay, I knew I know women can have multiple orgasms. Yeah. But you're saying also there's, there's different kinds of orgasms. There's different kinds. Yeah. All right. Well, Most women don't know they can have seven kinds I of orgasms. I want to know more. <laughs> Tell this, me. The, 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 the vagina is like, you know, we know more about the moon. <laughs> I right. think we've, we've sent scientists to explore the moon more than we've just like even explored our own sexuality or our wow. bodies. I've worked with a scientist at um, Rutgers University, Barry Kamasurik, and he does studies where they do like MRI brain scans and um, just study. And he said it is so hard to raise money for these kinds of studies around sex because of the taboo around sex. So, you know, again, we'll go to the moon, we'll study anything else. But once we get to sex, which is the most important thing to understand about ourselves, the most natural thing, that is the hardest thing to get any funding around. Well, let me just interject this because we got to move on. But one of the things I keep talking about on this show, and it's very important to me, mm -hmm. is, is the sovereignty of our own body. Yeah. What we do with our body, what we put into our body. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you are not free if your mind and your body is not free. Yeah. So when you talk about these things, that's what I think of. Let, let's move on to relationships because right now, I mean, that's what you do mostly. You try to help people. Yeah, I try to bring people illumination and education around their own bodies, their sexuality, and understanding, you know, their subconscious behaviors and where they're stuck, you know, and their trauma doesn't have to be as extreme as mine, but pretty much everybody walking around has some kind of trauma or interrupted sure. pattern from their childhood and finds themselves, why do I keep, you know, doing what I hate? Why do I keep saying, you know, like, I don't want to eat that, but I keep eating it. Or I say I'm going to work out and I don't. Or I say I'm going to have a different kind of partner relationship and I don't. Or I'm going to stop watching porn and they don't. Whatever it is, people are stuck. So those are all smaller traumas that are breakdowns in your childhood development and the early years that affect how you're walking around. And they're actually all connected to your second chakra or your drive for pleasure, which is your sex drive. It isn't just about having sex. It's the drive to experience pleasure as a person or a human because the sexual orgasm is so intense in our brain, it's like doing heroin. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a little bit of it when you have a shot of espresso. You know, you can get it in food, you can get it in sex, you can get it in alcohol or drugs. And so it's, I really try and make people aware, you know, what are your patterns of having pleasure in your life? Or are they in alignment with the kind of person you want to be? Or are you suppressing 
so much around your pleasure drive, your sexuality, that it's just kind of exploding in other ways or that you feel you know, you're living a small life when you could be living a big life. Wow, okay. <laughs> um, I'm trying to just get that in. I mean, everything you're saying makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a complex thing to work upon. Well, it's the most simple and the most complex. You know, and, and so people don't want to get started, right? So everybody's in this like. Well, everybody's freaked out about it. Like, oh, if they knew that yeah. about me or what have you, then or is, that, is that right or? Everybody, I think people are lying to themselves, you know, it's like, and lying to each other. And you, you were just going to talk about monogamy, right? You, yeah. you dropped the M word. Um, you know, I, I like that subject. So I think monogamy is one of those places that we find the way we actually live now in the world we're living in, I mean, things are moving so fast with technology, yeah. the internet, and our ideas of monogamy are like from the dark ages. Like literally yeah. we defined monogamy and marriage the way it is now such a long time ago and so much has changed. Um, and then nobody wants to look at that. And I think that things are starting to change. Millennials are starting to have different attitudes about marriage and monogamy and even like heterosexuality versus mm -hmm. homosexuality. I think we're starting to see more of a scale. And the way that I look at it is, I don't think people, I don't think there's a right or a wrong, where we, where we really right. mess ourselves up. We go, this is right and that's wrong. This, you're a good girl or a bad girl or a good boy or a bad boy. Right. Instead of saying, you know, we're complicated creatures with these primal desires, um, but you know, then we have to learn what choices we make affect, you know, the consequences in our life. But like, I think some people are literally 100% happy being monogamous. There's sure. that end of the scale. And they just, they really are. They're yeah. totally fulfilled being monogamous. And then you have people over here and they'll never be happy being monogamous. It's very natural for them to have multiple partners or more variety. And I think it also is connected to the drive for stability and security is rooted closer to monogamy and the drive for variety um, and, and like excitement is on you know like having multiple partners or mm -hmm. having less committed relationships, and I think a lot of people fall in between um, those sure. two kind of poles. But I think um, people need to just start being honest about what their desires are. I am completely supportive of open relationships. I myself have open relationships, n not so much like the um, not polyamorous. I think that's too defined. I'm just very honest with anyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just like mostly I'm like, I'm too busy to probably be in a super committed monogamous relationship. And, and so I'm honest about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of people feel so ashamed that they lie, you know, and, and that I don't support. I just recently had someone come to me and that was an issue. Like, what do you say to someone if you know her husband's cheating? Like, you know, and just, uh, what do you say? What do you do? You know, that I, I don't, again, I, like I don't have 100%, you have to look into the situation. Right. But what to me is sad is that, you know, here you have the husband lying, here you have, it, and it's because we don't talk and because I think as a society and a culture, we haven't really been willing to shed more light into, you know, what is monogamy? What are our models for relationships now? You know, and, and where does your sexuality fit? Are you, I mean, are you a more monogamous person or happily a less monogamous person? You're asking me? Yeah, why not? Put you in the hot spot. I, well, okay, wait a minute. Rest, rest, <laughs> restate that though. Am I more monogamous or less monogamous? So are you happier being more monogamous or less monogamous, do you think, naturally? Do you have one? How much of your life have you spent in either? I'm interviewing you, Saul. <laughs> okay. So, um, well, let me ask you this. Didn't want to tell on yourself. It's okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I, you know, I'm monogamous. It have been for a long time. Okay. But here's the deal. I mean, monogamy does seem anachronistic. I mean, we mm -hmm. are biological organisms with a biological imperative. Right. So here again, we're talking about this social structure that has been handed mm -hmm. down to us for freaking decades or centuries, you know, thousands of years, that this is how it's going to be. And, you know, you should probably stick to this. So I, I'm just putting it out there because... There is no right or wrong answer. I just wanted right. to talk about it. Yeah, no, I think just talking about it is good too. But I, I, here's the other thing I find is people come to me and they go, you know, do I think monogamy is better, non-monogamy is better? I say you really have to look at your situation. Yeah. If, you're, if you want to have more stability in your relationship and take less risks, then stay monogamous. Yeah. That's just the truth. Right. It doesn't, we don't live in some perfect world, right? We live in this world and we do have to kind of deal with the structures of our society. Um, but if you want to open that up or you feel your relationship is kind of already falling apart, then and you want to open that up to being an open relationship or an open marriage, just that people understand that 
that puts it at a higher risk because you're just kind of introducing more excitement and also more chaos yeah. along yeah. with that. And I, you know, I admit, I, I'm being a bit of a smart ass when I didn't give you an answer. Um, <laughs> but it's my show. Uh, you can do what you want. So let me ask you this. Well, then what is your opinion? What is true love? Oh, I think, um, I think mostly I'm just like really annoyed <laughs> with, really? I think that, that idea, like what is love? You know, I, I've thought before. So it's like a PIL song or something. It just I don't know. I feel, I feel like I would just make a lot more money if I just like, oh, I, you know, I'll, I'll teach everyone how to like get married immediately and, and, and find true love. Um, but I just think it's, it's so much of a bigger idea than that. And I think people shove all their problems into this love Whether box. Whether it works or not? No, just they go like, if I, if I found true love, my other problems would go away. Right. And really, I think you have to love yourself first. Yep. And I think learning to love yourself is not easy and, 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 and it's a process. But when you do, I think, um, and, and my opposite, like really loving yourself is respecting yourself. So I think, you know, instead of chasing around true love or the perfect partner, you know, learning how to love yourself and respect yourself is, is really important. And that's a, a message I would really like to get to, you know, like younger teenage girls. It's like, first love yourself and respect yourself before you run around looking for attention or true love or, you know, a panacea to all your problems in, in finding, you know, like love or whatever that is, boyfriend. <laughs> I understand. Um, wow. Well, when you talk about young people, one of the things that goes off in my mind immediately is this right now, this hookup culture. And, and I get a lot of questions from the crew here because um, sometimes when I have a very interesting person coming on like yourself, I, I ask the production crew, hey, what, what, would, what do you think would be a good question? So mm -hmm. some of these have come from them and, and we were having a discussion the other day and uh, we were talking about a particular individual it was like, dude's totally addicted to his phone because if like if he puts his phone down and we're talking, he might mm -hmm. miss you know, something on Tinder or something. Right. So in this culture in which now, because we used to court, or at least we used to buy you a drink, you know, it's right. like, <laughs> and these days, you know, it's like, I guess flick right, flick, flick, you know, it's just, what is that? I mean, am I just the old guy who's like not <laughs> feeling it or what? Um, I'm on Tinder. Okay. I'm on Tinder, um, but you're I'm, also, I'm a busy woman. But you're also, <laughs> yes, and you're also an adult with a fully yeah, developed because emotional. Because Tinder goes like this. Tinder's like, you know, left, 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 a hundred times for maybe one right. but And then they still have to buy me a drink. As they should. It's, but, okay, but seriously, my question is, because I heard you in, a, in an interview, and ultimately this is where we're going with this. Sex mm -hmm. is energy. Yes. And that's why you do what you do. Yeah. And that's why you don't want to just have sex with everybody because you're spreading right. your energy around, right? And you're mixing your energy with other people. So all I'm saying is if I'm a young man or young woman mm -hmm. right now and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm just having, that's the only way I'm having sex. And it's like, it's anonymous and it's quick and it's whatever. Does that not set me up in a mental way going forward, you know, does, I don't know. Does, do you think that's going to have an effect on our culture or am I just... I mean, I think our culture is changing regardless. Mm -hmm. And so, again, what I just try and teach people, it's, it's not whether there's Tinder or not, it's how you use Tinder. Sure. Just like, you know, anything can be medicine or poison. So, you know, it's not whether there's fast food in the world, it's how you consume things. Sure. So, you know, you can use Tinder as a way to get to know people, have a longer conversation, um, make sure you feel respected, you understand your own needs, you speak your truth about what you really yeah. want. Um, I think then it's fine. But if you're already hiding all those things and now everything moves go. faster, then yeah. yeah, it can be multiplied and maybe even accelerated. This, they're the same problems people have always had, but perhaps they can be accelerated mm -hmm. through how fast technology moves now. So I think it's more important than ever that we start to have better sexual education. And, and just to, you know, I, I'm pissed off about, you know, Facebook. It might as well be the Catholic Church at this point because I can't run an ad for sexual education because they call it really? porn, but more and more people are exchanging dick pics and hooking up, and there's a rise in STDs with millennials because of all the social media that you're bringing up, because it's easier to make a hookup anonymously, and less, and, and, and these same structures that are allowing people to do the hookups and exchange dick pics, whether they want to admit that's what they're doing or not, that is being used for that, they're still saying anybody using the word sex for sexual education is porn. 
they need to be responsible. Facebook needs That's to be ridiculous. responsible. Twitter needs to be responsible. That if they're going to have this service where people do hook up more easily, that they you know weigh the scales out by sure. providing more positive sexual education, more talking about how to avoid STDs, more talking about safe sex. That has to be equally out there on these platforms. And you literally, I can't pay them to run an ad for that right now because they put me in the same box as porn because of the shame around sex. So that's something that needs to change. Wow, well, I, I did not know that. I, that's the stupidest, right. silliest. And they pretend it's because they're moral. They go, oh, because we can't allow sexuality on the platform. We're Please. gonna know every single thing BS. about you. I call you bullshit and, again. Yeah, we're gonna follow on you. Facebook yeah. and on Twitter. The minute you leave Facebook, we know the next <laughs> 10 sites you go to. However, we're not gonna let Psalm have right. an ad. Right, and if my FB account gets blocked, I'll, I'll know you FB, yeah. you did it. <laughs> wow, well, I was not aware of that. It doesn't really surprise me. Um, well, tell me about, in the time that we have, mm -hmm. tell me about Tantra because yeah. I, I know you're sick of talking about Sting and all that. But it's <laughs> like, what is Tantra? And and some people will say chakras and all these things like right. that can't be real. Enlighten me. Tantra, at its simplest way of looking at it, is understanding that with everything and especially sex, there's a mind, body, spirit connection. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people, there's all these myths and Tantra has gotten a confusing name or it's you know, too weird or takes too much time. You know, you, do, you, know, you have to have sex for nine hours right. like Sting or you, know, you have to eat kale chips all day or do right. yoga or you're not in shape for, for Tantra. It's none of that. Tantra is literally just understanding that there's a mind, body, spirit connection. And that especially with sexuality, you want to make sure you, you're connecting on all three of those layers. And so you can, for yourself, Tantra for one means learning how to connect to your own sexual energy, to own it, to have sexual education and positive experiences and to value you know, yourself as a man or a woman, to be educated. And Tantra for two means that you can have that deeper kind of soul connection. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in some corny way, you know, like soul connection. It's literally saying that's not, that's not, you, that's not you know, like taking in that it, it, sex is not just some way we can use each other physically. Sex is something that we can connect psychologically yes. and our, our it's energy. Our, absolutely. That it's like two people having the most beautiful experience I think two people can have. And again, the best experience. Yeah, and, and, and we as a society have perverted that. We've said sex is something dirty or sex is something that distracts us or sex should be kept in the shadows or, or secret. Literally, it should be the thing that we say is the most sacred thing two human beings can experience together. And, and not because you're in love forever, or not, but because it has power. And we have to understand the power of it and own that and get it out of kind of the shadow because when we don't educate ourselves around sex, unfortunately that leaves room for all the sexual abuse, mm -hmm. um, sexual violence, the rape culture on college campuses, you know, so much of it in the news all the time now. And I, I think we're finally coming to a point in history and, and in the news that people are willing to talk about this stuff. And, and I'm glad and I'm, you know, like really um, here to be a voice to encourage other women, other men, other people to open their voice around any sexual abuse and also learn to, you know, by doing that to value themselves and, and, and totally just get rid of that shame around sexuality. You have a studio here in LA? I don't have a studio because I travel too much. So okay. I have my online video courses okay. at psalmazadora.com and that's where people can go and learn about seven kinds of orgasms. Men can learn, women can learn and get enlightened <laughs> with Tantra and your sexuality. Um, and I have free videos so it's a really great for people to go check that out. And also f people can follow me at Samazadora on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it's the same. Well, we're gonna put, we're gonna put all the links yes. for all your stuff in the synopsis. Um, I think you're really fun. <laughs> um, listen, you're also in a reality show, so yes. let's talk about that. You're, sure. you're in this thing called Cougar Club. Yes. It's on the Playboy channel. I know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So first, I haven't seen it yet. I, well, tell when me. first I got asked to do it, I yeah. was like, oh my God, do well, I really not? have to say it? Like, basically, I'm saying I'm a cougar. I'm owning that Is term. Is that a bad thing? You know, I used to just think it was kind of an annoying term because for, like what are men like what's the freaking equivalent you know what i mean like is there some if, if a 40 year old man is dating a 30 year old woman we don't even bat an eyelash there's not a name for that 
if there's a 10 year difference between a man and a woman, they're like, oh good, he's like, you know, a little older. He's more serious about what he's doing. So I think the fact that there, we call it something um, means that we're, you know, that ass backwards. Well, about and probably here again. Women's a, sexuality. Well, that's probably, again, again, a name that men came up with, don't you think? Maybe, but I mean like, you know, women are, we hit our sexual prime, you know, at 40. And Beautiful. men hit their sexual prime, you know, in their 20s. So like, what are we to do? <laughs> what what is it? What is a sexually active, like a powerful woman to do in her forties? <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we can still keep up. I personally, but um, <laughs> well, let me. Okay. Especially once you learn tantra. That, that, hey man, I'm, I I need to get on that website. So, mm -hmm. okay, the reality show. This is mm -hmm. you. You look fantastic. Right. You look like that's, that's the. Playboy version. It's brilliant. Video. It looks like you're in Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Yes. I used to work on that show. Yes. So I wanted to ask you about this. How do you feel about being in a reality show? You know, I actually, like, I had a lot of fun, but it was very stressful. Sure. I do have to say, you're like yeah. in this fishbowl. No, it's like somebody has a magnifying glass on you with the sun burning a hole on you. Yeah. Like the, the whole time, you know, every everybody's watching you and there's all this pressure to, you know, to, to not to perform, but just to be, like keep it moving, keep it yeah. moving. Um, so that was intense. That, that was intense and then I found on the show that I did because we were bringing in sexuality mm -hmm. and it was showing, you know, women um, really just dating, you know, women dating younger guys and owning their sexuality and being who we were. Um, I was in alignment with that. I was like, you know what, I stand for anything that kind of brings more light to sexuality. And, and so it was good. Playboy provided a big platform for me to be able to do that, but it was, you know, Interesting to be going on on dates and amorous encounters with the cameras on and yeah. you know that that kind of added pressure I'm an exhibitionist exhibitionist anyway, so that part you know when they're like well You're gonna have to be you know naked. I'm like well if there was a reality show, you know naked most of the time <laughs> like, Hey, man, if that's it's supposed to be reality and reality I was well, like, like I'm, I'm probably one of the few people that it wouldn't be for extra ratings. Right. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I, you know, I, I love my body. I'm comfortable, at, you know, with myself. And when I'm at home, you know, a lot of times I sleep naked. I walk around naked. So. Well, you're vivacious. You, <laughs> yeah, you're fun. Um, we're gonna wrap this thing up, I think. But, so what are you up to next? What, what are you? You have so many things going on. Yeah. What are you doing right now? As well. Yeah, so I'm I, I'm traveling. I, I I'm a speaker at yeah. kind of large events. I'm about to go to Greece and uh, be a speaker at something called A Fest on um, sex, shame, and your brain. Um, so that's really exciting. Is is starting to spread the sexual education in larger movements and globally, um, creating more videos. So more of the tantra videos, partnering with a lot of bigger companies. That's exciting, and I'm developing a new TV show, um, which is more centered around you know like you know, my vision and, and my work, which mm -hmm. is great. So, um, yeah, I'm just excited about, you know, getting this message on a global scale and then really being able to also, um, through, you know, liberating sexuality, through showing an example of just living, you know, as, as a more sexually liberated woman, and then, you know, being able to help other people who want to learn or especially people who, who want to learn to, you know, uh, release their old traumas and have sexual healing or open their voice. Um, that's, you know, that's exciting. I'm going to be doing that on a, a global scale. Okay. Well, I'm glad you said that because the last thing is, again, we're talking about energy. So when a person has, and this is what you're trying to help them with, when a person has this retained right. trauma within their body, you could go to all the therapy that you want to, mm -hmm. but it would still be in the cellular memory yep. of the physical organism. So that's the secret to the yoga, I guess, is because you're expelling it through your breath. The and, yoga and the tantra, the mind, body, spirit connection. And it's just crazy to me, again, that we live in a world where everybody is so in their heads yep. and so disconnected or from our body. Or on a monitor. Yeah. And I think it goes back to that kind of shame of our bodies and our sensuality and our sexuality. So we spend more and more time up here and, and I want to fix myself and I want to fix myself, but your body doesn't lie. And that's the thing. If you really want to, you know, heal old traumas or change patterns in your life, you have to go to the body. And that's what I'm really good at. I'm really good at bringing people there and kind of pushing them past their edge 
and getting them to their like that little rock bottom so they can actually have an aha moment and turn around and change. Wow. Well, I like it. So, Mr. Dora, <laughs> thank you for coming on today. I hope you're yeah, going to come on so again much. because yeah. uh, you're a lot of fun. And ladies and gentlemen, if you like these kind of shows, I'm going to try to do more of these as well because the name of the show is Antidote. And I didn't name it that just because I thought it was clever. I named it that because I wanted this to be a solution-oriented show as well. It's, it's not enough to point out the bad guys in the world. You've got to offer up some solutions. And that's why I always say the same things to you guys. Stay optimistic. Stay vigilant. You, me, every single one of us, we are the antidote.